So now that we're in our little conference room, I'm going to start off to my left and I'll start off to my Keisha. Would you please introduce yourself to the panel? Absolutely. Can you hear me all right? I can. All right. Thank you so much. I'm Mike Keisha Anderson Jones, the Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer at Millbank. I'm headquartered in New York. I'm resident in New York and we are a global firm. I have been in this role, it'll be three months tomorrow. So I'm having my own anniversary, clap, clap, clap. Um, I've been in this space uh, for quite a few years uh, working for American Express uh, for three years in, in that role, but de and I has been a thread uh, throughout my career even without the name and without doing it uh, formally. So thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Next, Elena. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And, and Rashida, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I too am celebrating uh, close to a month. Next month, November 2nd, I'll be one year at KPMG. Prior to that, I spent 21 years in diversity and inclusion in HR roles at PwC. And prior to that, worked for an organization called Inroads, where we place talented minority youth in organizations like all of ours. So it's a pleasure to be here and look forward to the conversation. Awesome. Sylvia? Hi, I'm Sylvia James. I'm the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Winston and Strawn. I have been with Winston since uh, September 2017. So just uh, celebrated four years at Winston. I was elevated to the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer um, position almost a year ago, effective October 1st. Prior to Winston, I um, served 11 years as the Diversity Council for Baker Botts. And prior to that, I practiced for 10 years as a labor and employment lawyer um, and five of those years in the Corporate Diversity Counseling Group. So I've been focused on diversity issues for 20 years. It's a long time. I'm so pleased to be part of this panel. Awesome. And you, it seems like the three of us have kind of a little connection right here. So I'm going to turn it over to Yusuf. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Yusuf Zakir. I'm the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at Davis Wright Tremaine. I'm uh, this month will be my one year anniversary here. Um, I've been DNI for about six or seven years. I was at Holland Night uh, before coming here, which is the common thread. Uh, Sylvia and Rashida, both, all three of us were at Holland uh, and was at Latham before that. I started off as a practicing lawyer, was a litigator for a number of years uh, before transitioning into the DNI space on a full time basis. But I'm excited to be here and excited to sit at this uh, virtual table with all of you. Thank you. Awesome. Lloyd, close us out. I will close us out. Lloyd Freeman, uh, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney. Uh, I sit out of the firm's Philadelphia office. Uh, I will celebrate one year, uh, November 4th. It was the day after Election Day when I started. Um, prior to coming to Buchanan, I was at another firm for 14 years, and I was in a bit of a hybrid function. I was a partner and Chief Diversity Officer uh, at my prior firm, but very happy to have put away my billable hours and to be doing the DNI work full time. Happy to be here and thank you for the invite, Rashida. So one of the common threads I think that everybody could say is that we all kind of started this journey about a year ago um, with, I will start with my Keisha being the, the, the newest on the block, but not really new to the space um, and talk about, you know, what has that journey been like for you over this, over this past year, particularly in this moment that's very unprecedented and seeing the elevation. There's six of us coming from very different backgrounds and we're all in this role, you know, within the past year. What has it been like for you? Well, you asked about the, the last year, and I would say the last year has probably been for me, and, and I would suspect for many others, one of the wildest times, uh, you know, in, in my life. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, being around and witnessing the impact of, of, of George Floyd's murder and um, sort of the social uprising and the social justice uprising that really took hold within corporations. I was inside of, of a corporation at that time. Um, and, you know, in the last six months and then three months, uh, transitioned and have moved into this space uh, to lead diversity, equity, and inclusion at the firm. 
And so it has been, I think, transformative both personally, but also professionally to look at the similarities as well as the distinctions across corporations and law firms and actually be able to bring um, perspective about what a client wants, what a client is interested in seeing or is requiring um, of law firms. I think that has been incredibly helpful to my understanding of this space within the law firm. And then the flip side is, you know, I, I stopped practicing almost two years ago, too many to count, so I'm not going to, to clarify the number. Um, but, but rejoining a firm uh, and seeing the nuance between working in a, a great law firm, and, and no bank is that, uh, versus working in a corporation, while keeping DE&I at the center of conversations has really been eye-opening. So having been here three months, you know, it's, it's really about a, a learning tour and a listening tour and understanding the processes within the firm, the operations, the people, the systems, and the behavior or the culture of the firm and how all of that um, is impacted by diversity, equity, and inclusion every day. So I am building the DEI house, as I call it. And we had a great team in place when I joined. Uh, and so really trying to bring all of that together in a strategic way um, has been incredible. It's an incredible opportunity. It's a challenging time, as we all know. COVID has added so much uh, flavor and spice to what was already difficult work. Um, and so, you know, it's just a great opportunity to make an impact. I love that about the flavor and spice. And I think that's a really great segue to just talk about Elena's role, because one of the things that I thought about, all of us, the other five of us are all at you know, big law, but the big four has kind of been a pioneer already. They're really pushing the envelope with diversity, equity, and inclusion for many years and being on the forefront. And so coming into a role where this has been your, your practice and your career, what's some of the nuances that you've seen as even the big four have been pushing the envelope about addressing um, equity, diversity, and inclusion at their organizations? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that we've all will, will attest to is that the sense of urgency around the work has been elevated over the course of not only this last year. And you could see that by many organizations having a diversity role or function. And so as teams are ramping up, that is a big change that we've all seen. I think another big thing is around how do we talk about diversity a little bit more uh, fluently and people feeling comfortable engaging in those discussions where it used to be sort of taboo and feeling like you have to talk about business case. I feel like that's not a conversation you have to have as much of anymore because if people are asking the business case, it's sort of what are we what are we really um, doing? Um, and so I think that that's a little bit easier. One of the things I wanna make sure is how do we keep the pressure on? Because even as the year has been progressing and we're reaching our um, one year anniversaries, how do you keep this top of mind? And I think our clients are helping to do that. As Mikeisha said, there's no way that this can't be a part of the conversation. Our clients are expecting us to show up um, and that people, across the organization, everybody's responsibility. Uh, so that's one of the big things that over the course of the last year we've been trying to do is how do you engage everyone feeling like they have a role to play in what we're trying to accomplish. And that because you might be a white male, that doesn't mean you're excluded from this conversation. And there's not a zero sum gain in which we're trying to accomplish. So I think that's sort of the, the journey that we've been on as an organization over the course of the last few months. And we'll continue to be on because we know that this will not be change that happens overnight. Um, and that other dimensions of diversity also feel like they may be at a loss. And so how do you have that conversation? Our veterans are important, our individuals with disability, apparent or non-apparent, um, as well as all of the other dimensions. So it's not at the expense of any one group. I think that's the biggest journey that we've been on organizationally, try to get people to appreciate. So. Thank you for letting me share that um, and look forward to the dialogue. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I like that how you've talked about the diversity is now the, the bucket's bigger or what we're talking about because there's so many other issues 
that have now become apparent. We're all having our eyes open. So that brings me to Sylvia. Sylvia, you're unique in the sense that you were in this role and then you were promoted and elevated. So what was that like in terms of the work that you'd already been doing um, and now having that other you know, additional seat at the table being elevated to the chief diversity officer? Great question that I've been asked um, a lot within the last year. I, I don't think that um, a lot changed um, in some ways because I think that there are lots of people who are doing um, a chief diversity officer uh, job without the title, right? So if your organization, um, the highest uh, level for diversity is the director level, then those directors um, could very well be doing a lot of the same um, things. I do think titles matter, um, both internally and externally. Uh, so I think that there's um, some value to that. But I do want to acknowledge that there are people who are operating at the highest level um, without the title. What the title has meant to um, my work personally is um, the seat at the table that we always um, talk about and access to information. A lot of the times I felt like, um, uh, depending on your role, then information filters um, down to you when you haven't had an opportunity to kind of weigh in um, because you, you weren't there when the decisions were made. Um, so I appreciate uh, being there from the beginning and um, having a voice uh, because in a lot of organizations like Winston, um, we may end up being the only people of color um, on the C-suite level, right? And so, that, um, that voice and that perspective um, is really needed and important, so. Thank you. And then just turning to Yusuf, you made a change. So you were already working in a diversity space at a law firm and now you are leading at a new, a new law firm um, and had an existing team. So what has it been like to just kind of build out your team over the past year? So it's been uh, definitely, like Mikisha mentioned, it's been an exciting time, but also a very different time in a whole lot of ways, right? Um, I started, like many of us who started a year ago at a new firm, we started in a pandemic, right? We started remotely. So I finished my job in the same room and I started my new job in the same room and the laptop changed. And so, you know, thinking about what the organization is and figuring out, you know, all the different components of it, you had to kind of do from here. Um, and that required... A lot of Zoom calls, right? Because that's all we could do. Um, but in some ways was massively beneficial because you could meet with a whole swath of the organization very quickly uh, and collect a whole bunch of information very quickly. That allowed us really to more quickly than I probably would have expected, do a SWOT analysis around where we are at the organization and then transform that into a strategic plan, again, on a timeline that I probably wasn't even anticipating myself. Um, we built that plan around four pillars at our firm. So it's community, growth, education, and engagement. So community is how do you foster that sense of an inclusive culture? Growth is how do you ensure equity and access to opportunities? Education is how do you elevate consciousness individually, collectively? And engagement is how do we collaborate with external stakeholders, including our clients? Um, and I've, it sounds like I'm reading that because I've said it four billion times, um, but that's the whole point, right? You got to keep talking about the, 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 your framework and you got to keep people to get used to what the framework is. Um, because of all that and because of the strange nature in which we started, um, we also had space to really develop a team in a, in a different sort of way. And so once we had that framework built up, we developed a team around that framework. So we have uh, managers who are responsible for some of those pillars. We have a, a director of operations that helps manage uh, those folks. And we were able to really implement a lot of this in, in, in this kind of challenging time that we find ourselves. Um, now that we're a year in, I think one of the things that I'm now mostly thinking about is what is that next year going to look like? And all those things that we've done over the past year to kind of get this thing teed up, how is it going to look, right, as we get into whatever the new normal is going to be? Um, and that's probably something that I would say keeps me up a bit at night, I think. 
Lloyd, I think what, what's interesting even about your journey is that you were doing it kind of as a hybrid, which I'm, I can only imagine you had two full-time jobs. So now that you only have one full-time job, how have you been able to transform and make such a quick impact as you're coming up on your year anniversary as well? God bless the folks who are still doing this in a hybrid function <laughs> because those are superheroes. Um, it's hard because, you know, what we're engaged in is change management. Uh, and you're really trying to transform cultures uh, within some, you know, very old organizations, organizations that have been around, you know, much longer than we all have. And, and so for you to come in and to make the kind of large wholesale sweeping changes that we're trying to make, but then have to also practice law with that individual, um, you know, to be staffed on a matter with that individual or to have to staff them on one of your matters when you're sitting there telling someone, listen, uh, I think we need to be a bit more equitable in the way that you staff your cases. Okay, so by the way, can you have that brief to me by tomorrow? I mean, it's, it's hard to have both of those hats on and never really know which one you can take off. And if I could really speak, you know, quite frankly, because I feel like I'm amongst fran friends and family here, sometimes you have to get into folks' business and you have to tell them, listen, we need to put you on a plan to improve the way in which you're um, uh, advancing diversity and inclusion. That's my nice way of saying it. Uh, because, you know, we, we understand that you're someone who can really make decisions in this organization um, and they can really affect uh, a lot of our uh, individuals who come from those underrepresented groups, uh, which there is such a premium on that talent. And so we don't want to lose that talent. And I want to tell you, listen, I need you to really be one of the drivers of change in the organization and to be able to have that hat on as a member of the management team, someone in leadership and not have to worry about also working alongside, uh, you know, uh, them in matters or cases. Uh, it's refreshing. Um, and, you know, I'm going to borrow from my Keisha. She's selling me that we're, we're building houses here. We got to make sure that we're building brick houses. We're trying to build long systemic change within these organizations. And so no matter how much, you know, the big bad wolf is out there huffing and puffing at the house, we got to make sure it doesn't blow down. And so that really requires, you know, like Yusuf was saying, strategic plans. I mean, that, that involves like, you know, Sylvia was saying, do those assessments within the organization. I mean, that's a lot of work. And so if you really want to do this job and do it right, you really have to make sure you've got someone who's thinking about DE and I full time, not just something that's pushed to the corner of their desk. And you can think about it on a cyclical basis because all the other committees in a law firm, or I'm sure even in house, they do work on a cyclical basis. The promotions committee meets when it's promotions time and the comp committee meets during comp time. That diversity committee, they can't just meet during Black History Month. Uh, you know, we got people who are black 365 days in a year. And I just picked black because, you know, I, I'm a little familiar with it. Um, uh, so I, I'm saying that you have to have someone who's going to drive, you know, that committee and drive that change uh, every day of the year. And so that's what has been so great about being in this role full time, Rashida. I want, so now that we've kind of set the foundation, I'm going to do more of the rapid fire in the questions because we've ha we had such a great um, pre-planning meeting and you guys have so much to say that I want to make sure that we get through some within moderation, Sylvia, moderation in terms of the topics that we talked about. So let's, let's dive deep because I think Lloyd hit on a point. Let's talk about bias, right? How does it show up and how do we continue to find ways to root it out? Um, I will reach out to anyone who wants to start us off um, on the conversation about bias. So I'm a nerd about bias, so I'll start. I think it shows up in all parts of uh, the cycle from recruiting, who we recruit, where we recruit, um, what standards we hold them to, to uh, work assignments, who has um, access to challenging skill building assignments, um, especially in the free market system, which is a very, you know, difficult place for, um, you know, all different diverse groups. So having access to challenging skill building assignments, and when you have that access, actually getting quality, uh, developmentally rich uh, feedback. And then it definitely shows up in performance um, evaluations. Um, and so bias shows up in every step of uh, the work cycle. And um, we have to have initiative strategies, what we do as individuals and what we do as an organization. 
uh, to disrupt it um, in every in every part and, and several tools so that people are not just waiting on the organization to make changes, but that people feel empowered, the things that they can do to interrupt their own biases. And I think that goes back to what Elena was saying. You're saying that it belongs to everybody. So yeah. how does how are you looking at disrupting bias at KPMG? Yeah, and I would add just if we think about also succession planning. So who are we putting in our next roles as far as leaders, future leaders, and how, how that shows up. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do is have people be more educated on what their individual biases are, because we all make decisions in every aspect of what we do every day. So making it a part of our curriculum has been part of the path right? How, how do you become more familiar so that as you make your next decision, you're slowing down enough to say, am I thinking about who might not be in the room? Who might not be the voice that we hear at the table? And also, who are we missing when we're having some of these conversations? Um, you want that to be a broad subset. And then also, is our process somewhat biased? You have to think about that. Are we being the most inclusive when we have calls and maybe not everybody is able to be on camera? Are we doing things where, you know, are we like thinking more holistically if we're trying to think about going back to the office? Is that going to disadvantage anyone? So those are the types of things that I think where bias shows up each and every day. And we need everyone to be thinking about how does this potentially help us or how could this education about ourselves get us to be better um, with, with the decisions? It, since it's so subjective, we all, we all have the ability to get better. And so it's a muscle. I like to think of it as a muscle that we have to uh, massage because you're never gonna be free of bias. We get through life every day around our biases, right? The preferences that we all individually have. And then when it doesn't show up in a broad way is what we, we need to improve. Rashida, if I may, just tagging on to those two things, which I know I'm not supposed to, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, also being clear broadly that we all have biases and we all have experienced some type of privilege and that having those biases or, or, or recognizing that you've had some type of privilege doesn't equate to you being a bad person, a terrible person. It's about how you, you, how you respond to those biases or those privilege privileges and how you create lanes for other people and opportunities for other people that's really important. And relatedly, also being crystal clear that um, diversity doesn't mean lower standards. Meritocracy um, is, a, is a great word and is a great thing. Once we have equity and equality, then we can talk about meritocracy because without the at least the equity piece, uh, there's a there's a huge gap. Um, and then the, the last thing is that uh, having diversity in and of itself um, doesn't mean that you have inclusion. And so if we don't figure out how to create inclusive environments where those voices and perspectives and um, differences are recognized and, and, and uplifted, then there's really uh, no point to this whole exercise. Lloyd, I was gonna ask you an interesting question because what I was gonna say, now that you've kind of transitioned and been full time, how have you really approached bias within the organization? You've had some excellent programming. And we've all talked about how the great thing about, I think the diversity space is the ability to share and learn from each other. And so you had a panel a couple uh, months ago where you had the chairman of your firm and one of your clients. Mm -hmm. And they talked a little <laughs> bit about bias and how that showed up, even from them from looking at it from maybe an economic standpoint, like maybe it was like, oh, you know, I came into the law firm, but I didn't have anybody who's a lawyer. So I had to figure it out. So isn't that the same for everybody else? But listen, we also had to talk about privilege because Makisha was right. For so long in these organizations, these have been like bad words and just getting people comfortable with talking about privilege. I mean, that's kind of just hurdle number one. Uh, and we had to get these individuals, which we're talking about, again, older, straight white men, and we're getting them to talk about privilege. That's not something that everyone's been comfortable doing. Uh, but then again, how do you, as a responsive leader, uh, take your privilege and transform it into something like allyship uh, and being a sponsor? 
uh, for another individual and talking about the succession planning and having that pipeline of leadership. Um, I'm also letting these individuals know, again, who have this, this level of gravitas or influence within the organization, um, that you have to anticipate uh, what some of these biases are. Because again, this is not like an, uh, I don't know, uh, a matter of first impression uh, when it comes around for evaluation time and we see bias in evaluations or a matter of first impression when we see bias in our hiring practices, right? So I'm changing the, the language there. And so we're not going to kind of wait until it happens and then interrupt it. We're just going to come in and we're going to disrupt it. And so we're going to start looking at those policies and those procedures and those processes. And how do we just disrupt the whole thing? It's clearly still producing bias. It's still not necessarily getting us the results that we want. So then how do we disrupt it? We need to make sure that we have something embedded in the process so that before we go ahead and, you know, make all of our compensation decisions that we have someone who, like the CDIO, who's going to come and look at that. And I'm going to sort this data and look at it and find out how much are our um, uh, men making as compared to our women uh, and how much are people of color making to their white counterparts, et cetera. We're going to sort that. We're going to put this data in front of your face. For too often, you know, organizations operate saying that they've got a DNI initiative. And they don't actually look at the data. You've got to be able to see the data. And so we put together a diversity dashboard because the same way that people like Elena go and look at law firms that they're hiring, hey, I look at my internal stakeholders and I go to my practice group chairs and I show them their diversity dashboard. It's essentially your diversity scorecard. How are you doing? And then how are you doing last year this time? Do we see what the trends are? Um, how much uh, attrition do we have in this particular group? And does it all tend to bend toward the attorneys of color or toward the women? And what can we do to change that? Again, you've really got to dig into this stuff if you want to make this uh, systemic change that we're looking for. Because, you know, I'm sure these organizations love for, you know, people like Sylvia to be there for as long as she has, but you may not. And if you don't, then you got to make sure that just because Sylvia leaves that you still got uh, you know, these processes in place. And so it can't be something that's kind of like these discrete programming um, uh, initiatives. It has to be something that's going to be long-term, it's going to outlast whoever your current chairman or whoever your current uh, CDIO is. I'm going to turn it both to both. I'd love for Sylvia and Yusuf to weigh in, particularly about that, that component about the performance review or the, the process and, and thinking about what have you had to do to kind of disrupt in those areas, if you've had to do that at all. So you want to go ahead or you want me to go? No, you go ahead. So uh, I wanted to, to that point, I think there's a kind of a broader challenge here that we've all kind of discussed and alluded upon. I think, you know, law firms are steeped in a couple of things. They're steeped in tradition and they're steeped in precedent. And both of those things are massive bias perpetuators, right? Um, lawyers, as a general rule, like, like to look in the past, right? As to define how they consider the present. Um, we're not necessarily taught or trained to look into the future. Um, so when we are always looking sort of backwards, we're going to allow the things that, you know, created and perpetuated those biases to persist. Um, and so one of the things that we think about when we think about any of these processes, performance reviews included, is that just because we've done a particular process in a particular way for a long time, doesn't mean that's the right way to do it. And so one of the things that we really like to do, and I personally like to do it, is thinking about the process. Because at the end of the day, if you can create adjustments to the process that even and sometimes may seem completely benign, honestly, adjustments and disruptions, um, but that can have an outcome that's going to be a little bit different for folks, that's a way to sort of create a, a tipping point uh, of support on this. Um, I also think the other thing we don't often talk enough about on this point too, is that there's a level of, I know that implicit bias plays a role, but there's explicit bias that plays a role too. Um, and it's, you know, we, we, I think we began being more comfortable talking about it after George Floyd, right? And I think we are far more comfortable talking about it at this point than we ever were before, but it has real impacts on all of these processes, right? I'm sure you all saw the, the Cornell study that came out, I think six weeks ago about how both, uh, they, they surveyed black and white employees, both groups preferred black employees who code switched as opposed to those who didn't. Um, and so there's these ex this preferences that we have on what we consider to be professional, what we consider to be that conduct in the workplace that then will touch on everything, right? And there's the consequences we're seeing on that. There's another study that mentioned that 3% of black professionals want to return to the workplace, right? 97% don't want to return to the workplace. 
because of the microaggressions, the discrimination, the challenges that they face, all these things are all tied together. And so when you are thinking about a specific process like a performance review, um, we've got we've to think that, we apply that holistic assessment to any of those processes as well, because all that stuff touches upon each other and it can impact the way that we do anything in a law firm. So the only thing I wanted to add is, you know, very important to the success of uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative is working collaboratively with others in the firm. And when you're on the practice side of things, you don't know how the law firm really works. Like, and then you get there and you're like, oh, this belongs to you and this belongs to me. And, you know, and there, there's a lot of adjustment and getting used to. One of the things that I have, um, enjoyed at Winston is how collaborative uh, people are and it's so it makes everything so much easier so on your question about performance reviews I was doing unconscious bias training and the um, senior staff person who is in charge of performance reviews came to me and said can you do a presentation can you do some training um, around how unconscious bias impacts uh, performance reviews and what people should do and look out for in before we start this evaluation process. And then they built it in to the review process that, you know, people who are going to be reviewing others have to go through this training. And I'd love to have taken credit for um, going to them and saying we should do this, but they they've bought in, they understand, and they're like, okay, can you do this and can you create it and uh, we'll get the people out and we'll build it into our process. So that has been uh, really helpful. And it gives me a chance to not just talk about studies that show how uh, implicit bias or biases or whatever impact the performance review process, but it allows you to make it really personal and say, this is how, we're not just talking about some study, let's just talk about us here at Winston and let's talk about our own organization and how biases uh, impact our own evaluations and people take notice of that. They're more likely to listen. I, I definitely continue to hear a constant thread about uh, you know, that self-evaluation. Um, I think what's also helpful in, in pushing the envelope is what our clients are asking of all of us. Um, and particularly, I think what was most exciting, I think, over the last couple of weeks is the fact that the SEC approved NASDAQ's new diversity requirements, which I think maybe even five years ago would have seemed unthinkable, right? That that would even um, be something that would come to fruition that they would get in. And for those who are not aware, um, NASDAQ pro uh, proposed new diversity requirements for public company boards. And the purpose is to usher in a new era of corporate board diversity and transparency. I almost think of it's like Sarbanes-Oxley 2.0, because the whole reason why we had Sarbanes-Oxley was because what was happening is that individuals were putting their friends on boards who may or may not have had the competency for that particular board. Um, even though in my past life, this was my favorite subject, which was financial fraud investigation. That is not a good thing for a public company. And so what was happening is that there was you know, kind of a free for all. And so, you know, organizations like KPMG and others have to come in. So great for Elena and her team, you know, to have to come in and try to put some controls on it. But obviously it started to weaken, you know, public confidence and public corporations and we can't have that, right? And from our financial system. So it's interesting to come full circle where they're pushing the envelope. I would probably say for myself, I probably spend maybe 50% of my time now trying to understand what our clients are asking in a meaningful way. Just kind of from the group, are you seeing an increase of not only what clients are asking from just demographic, but detailed about how are you measuring success? I could definitely start, but yes, increased conversations all around as far as what we're doing enterprise-wide. On, on diversity, right? So not just uh, about the engagement teams, but when we think about suppliers, when we think about just every aspect of what we do, they wanna know more. And so I think it's a healthy discussion and it actually helps the 
other partners and leaders and, and staff understand why this is important to our growth agenda as an organization. So if we're not all focused on it, again, the engaging everyone theme, if we're not all focused on it, how are we going to reach our aspirations? So I think it's extremely helpful to keep the pressure on that we're doing what we need to to. So I think it's it's healthy tension. Um, but the conversations have definitely increased. Anyone else? I have more to add on that. Uh, I'll tell you that we talked earlier about whether or not that business case is dead. I don't necessarily know if it's dead or not, but I can tell you that the clients have taken it and it is the onus is no longer on the CDIO to talk about this kind of in a silo by themselves. Uh, because the clients are not just asking you, you know, give me what percentage of women make up your firm and what percentage of, no, I've gotten clients who are asking me, tell me about the top 20% uh, of your highest compensated partners and what are the demographics behind those individuals? And tell me about the hours uh, of those individuals. You know, who's getting the most work? I mean, clients are all in the business as they should because they have to hold us accountable uh, because everyone has hired a chief diversity and inclusion officer and everyone has put out a statement and everyone has done, you know, a wonderful program and everyone has, you know, a, a, a DNI council or committee. But is it reflecting? Is it reflecting in how people are getting paid and how people are getting promoted and how they're getting staffed on matters? That's what counts. Uh, and so clients are absolutely driving that um, uh, you know, they're driving law firms to make drastic change uh, because no one wants to be kind of called to the principal's office uh, and have to answer for the exact same thing year after year because you know you're going to end up losing your recess. And, and in this sense, it's not about recess. We're talking about dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. Can I just add, though, the, the client imperative for um, uh, diversity you know, it, it it's why when I became a diversity counsel in 2006, right, that all law firms at the time were hiring um, someone, you know, to lead diversity because we're like, the clients are really demanded it. And over the years, it's changed in terms of, you know, over the last 15 years, having answered every diversity survey in the beginning, to the volume that we have now, there's no way I would have been able to do anything else and do any work and handle the volume and the detail um, in which, um, and I mean, to Lloyd's point, they're asking not only about the top con uh, compensated partners, but the detail including who are the leads for depositions? I mean, depositions, who took depositions, who stood up in court? And it is a very time consuming um, thing to respond to all these client surveys. And I do think there is more teeth um, to these than there have ever been. But this whole clients are asking for it, clients are, are asking for it. I've been hearing that for 15 years. And after a while, when you said that, um, Partners were like, yeah, 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 clients are asking for it. You can't say that the house is on fire for 15 straight years, right? After a while, people are like, well, I, I'm still okay. Um, yeah. So, but I do think that things um, are changing and we're seeing more teeth. The, there wasn't a lot of benchmarks and teeth. So um, it's really changing. The volume is also increasing at a rate that I find exhausting. Um, uh, but it, it's, it's good to, it's good to have the pressure, not just a survey that's going to take God knows how long, um, to complete. It also yeah. speaks to ensuring that you have the right team and not just one person representing yeah. all of DE&I for the firm or for a corporation. Uh, and in addition to that really speaks to the importance of ensuring that you have alignment in your organization, that there is shared ownership uh, in, in this work um, and in moving it forward. It, it's, it's not simply enough to have your DE&I team or even your business development person know some of the answers to some of the questions that certain clients are asking. You know, as I think about it, these are client relationships. And so whomever owns that relationship really needs to be not only participatory, but take a leadership role um, and an ownership role in making sure that the responses are clear and cogent and correct 
um, and are really be are, are really not only responsive to our clients needs, but also proactive. What can we glean from the questions that are being asked that puts us in a better position to help that client meet whatever its organizational needs are on a going forward basis? Or what can we glean that they haven't yet asked us for that we can offer? And this is where having the right team of folks within not just your DEI team, but within the entire organization, your associates, your partners, from a broad representation standpoint, becomes so important and so helpful. One of the things that I that also touched upon that is sometimes the elephant in the room talking about um, what does the book of business look like, right? We're all in professional services. And so the ability to affect change in an organization depends on who's sitting at the table. And often um, having that ability, that access to clients who want to pay your rates and that it aligns with the clients have a need and then you're an expert at doing that. And so stars do have to align, I think, at some point when we think about diversity. So when we're thinking about disrupting, how do we make it for not just the compensation so, so people don't end up being just service partners, but they're actually driving the relationships? Um, do you guys have programs within your firm that you're coaching or teaching people like how to develop business, how to build that trusted advisor, um, client relationship that I think is so critical to get you on the trajectory of sitting at the table. Mm -hmm. I'll start with Yusuf because you seem like we're nodding. If someone didn't see and know what we were talking about, they would think we were probably all at a conference, um, a concert. Because every time are. everyone talks, I see the little <laughs> head nod. So that's awesome. <laughs> no, to um, to your question, definitely yes. I mean, to, it's an important point that you bring up where who ultimately has credits who ultimately has ownership of a particular client or matters they're gonna have the most power ultimately in the room and i think so we have a we have a number of programs that are run sort of cross-functionally across the firm that focus on the future leaders of the firm right who who are these folks how are we developing them how are we giving them the coaching the sponsorship the mentorship that they need the training that they need to succeed to climb the ranks from whether that's counsel or contract partner, contract partner and equity partner, equity partner to leadership role at the firm. So different categories, depending on where the stage you are in your career. Um, but this also drives into the client element of this too, right? Um, we are, I think there's no disagreement, I think that a law firm is a client service and, and professional services organizations, right? We're client service driven. So we, that is, when we talk about business case, right? When we talk about whether DNI has an influence on the business case, to me that it's an existential question, right? Are we here to serve our clients, or are we here not to serve them? And so, if we're here to serve them, DNI is part of that, right? It's part of the service that we're providing. But there's a two-way street on that, right? When it comes to clients, to Sylvia's point, the survey numbers, it's just it's exponential increase, right? Um, and year over year too, the number of surveys that we're getting. So more and more time is being spent on that. But we, you need to attach some um, teeth to that too, right? So if you're going to want more diversity on your matters, Rishi, at the point that you mentioned where maybe your a client is thinking about a small slice of work, maybe small slice of low value work that they're willing to divvy up in a way that if thinking about diversity, but when it comes to their big matters, the quote unquote, you know, important matters about the company matters, they're going to go to the same people they always went to. And I think that, that that's that's a dance that we all need to kind of get better at, because it's one thing for to, to ask uh, law firms questions that we should be responsive. But uh, it is a two way street in terms of the sort of workflow that's coming in, what expectations, what responsibilities you're giving to folks, whether you're trusting ultimately your important matters to people who are diverse, right? And come from diverse backgrounds. Like that is critical. And I don't think we are fully there yet. And you all probably remember the back and forth that happened when in-house counsel wrote that letter uh, demanding more diversity. And then the response that came uh, from, from uh, nonprofit about, you know, wait, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, like, you know, let, let's, let's make sure that we're actually having a dialogue about what exactly it is that we're talking about and what matters in a law firm. And so I think that 
that conversation needs to happen more to your point about how do we develop the future leadership of the firm. It's not just going to happen within the four walls of a firm. Right? It's going to happen when there is a dialogue with clients about what expectations are to be successful in our organizations. And Elaine, I want to just turn to you because um, what, what has been said typically has been because law firm are very much about precedent. Now, sometimes we're a little bit 10 years behind like corporate America, the trends, right? I don't know if I was going to say a whole decade, but for the most part, when I, when you think about KPMG, your organization by far is the largest out of everybody sitting here. And how do you, you know, approach the data? Because I, I know that you have a big team and I, you probably could not sleep for weeks and weeks and weeks, but how do you figure out and prioritize to, to have those conversations so that the pipeline of leaders coming through are going to be reflective of what KPMG is going to need in the future. Yeah, so one of the things to level set and make sure that everybody knew where we were is we did a transparency report. So we issued a transparency report back in March uh, that really gave insight into how we are from a demographic standpoint. We talked about hires, we talked about promotions so that we have a report card each year. And so then you think about each part of our business and how that looks and what how that's reflected in the journey that we have to be on. So trying to get really surgical with our approach to each and every team on what that's going to look like um, and just have, have plans and hold ourselves accountable to that. So really trying to be um, surgical, but also really um, enterprise wide so that everybody feels yet again, that they have a role to play in helping us achieve our goals. So there's not one person that can't say that I don't have a role to play in what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, obviously our leaders are going to help drive that down, but then also bottom up. Because I think uh, the cultural piece too is we try to establish the experiences of our people on, on the ground. And that, that's gotta be the cultural piece that we have to work on too. So that no one feels like, okay, well, it's at their expense, my expense, you know, if, if we give to you or promote you that it's that I'm not promoting others, the pie will be bigger if we grow this right. And if everybody's approaching it with the growth mindset, I think we'll be in a much better place. And that's how we've been trying to structure it. So I see we have about 10 minutes left. And so I want to get into a little bit about this kind of speak up culture that I believe that I feel like we have been talking about. And then we've had a few questions that were already submitted. So I'll just go through those questions as well. Um, and so that we can make sure that we end on time. So I'm gonna start off with Lloyd. You know, how have you been encouraging allyship from your senior leaders to encourage the speak up culture? Sure. Well, the first thing you do is you have to educate them because you have to start with giving folks the benefit of the doubt that people are operating with blinders on and they don't yet know, you know, how, what the ripple effects are of certain actions and how it's impacting others. So you have to educate them, but then you have to hold them accountable. And so if I go and we do, and I don't call it training, I always call it education because, you know, if you, you go and you do like a training on, uh, you know, how to build your time or a training on how to, you know, uh, work the, uh, 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 reconciliation report to get your money back. You just do it once and you're done. But education is ongoing, right? We do continuing legal education. So we're going to continue our DNI education. And so you educate them on this. And then, of course, you have to, you literally have to call people out on it. Now you have to do it in a respectful way that still, of course, is showing your professionalism. But you have to let individuals know this is exactly what we talked about here, right? You know, we're, we're having two people in a room talking about how we're going to staff a matter. And, and you're telling me that, oh, no, we can't staff Rashida on that because I'm trying to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, she has a family. And so, you know, we can't staff her on this because this is going to be a six week long trial. I just educated you on this last week. And so you, you literally are going to have to do it in the exact same way that you reinforce anything else that you roll out. That's going to be, again, new policy or new practice or new procedure. Um, you're going to have to repeat it. Uh, and so you have to put it in front of them. You have to say it. You have to write it down. You have to let them read it. Uh, and then you're going to have to reinforce it. Uh, but you do need to have someone who is driving that because if you just think that you're going to roll something out and that organically everyone is going to catch on to it and uh, all of a sudden we're going to create this new culture, that's not how it's going to happen. Uh, and I don't really also subscribe to this whole, you know, the change is going to start from the top. I think you kind of addressed that. I mean, yes, we have to have someone at the top who's going to articulate it. Um, but I spend a lot of time talking to those individuals who manage the teams uh, because people leave, whether it's a law firm or any organization, because of their direct supervisor. You leave because 
because that individual is creating this culture where you feel like, please, I can't even, I can barely survive, let alone thrive. Uh, while working here. And so that has nothing to do with whether or not you like the CEO or whether the CEO seems like he or she is equitable in their decisions and the way in which they're running the organization it has to do with the person that you interact with day in and day out. Um, and so it's really those individuals for me that I make sure I give a lot of education to uh, about, you know, really being um, more than just performative allies and just saying, oh yeah, I stand with you. I support you. I'm here to make sure you have opportunities, but I'm actually speaking up for you. I'm actually giving you access and opportunity. That's what someone does when they really want to create this pipeline of leadership. They really want to create a diverse succession plan. And so that to that point, there's a concept when we think about others and, and we and who belongs. And so how have you approached that, not only just in your current role, but really through your journey? I mean, for those who don't know how fabulous Sylvia, she's like been a pioneer in the, t in the sense of, um, I, will, I, I will disclose just a little bit, but when Sylvia and I worked together, she was she was the senior associate and you know looking out for me. She made a pivot in her career that people said that's not going to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so, looking back, fifteen years, I can you really talk about this? How you figured out the others and belonging was going to be so impactful and so enriching for you personally. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, someone we both know who um, is <laughs> a partner at the firm, when I told him what I was going to do, I tell the story often because it so stuck with me. He um, said to me, why don't you just go be a janitor? Um, and <laughs> no disrespect to janitors, but he felt that I was so, he wanted to get across um, what a huge mistake he thought that I was um, doing that I was throwing away um, my legal career and going down this path that no one cared about and that the firm wasn't going to care about and it wasn't important and it was going to be short lived. Um, and so I, you know, he voiced what a lot of um, people were saying. I, I, I think almost to a person, I'm not sure if anyone encouraged me to, uh, to make the switch at the time. I think um, most people um, thought I was making a mistake. And I have to say along the journey of this, there were lots of times when I thought I had also made a mistake, right? <laughs> there were days where I'm like, did I just give him my legal career to do this? And because this work is um, extremely uh, frustrating and we don't have any crystal ball, right? We're learning along the way and we're, um, we're reading, we're taking from our own experiences, we're doing the studies. Um, but what I love that has helped um, is that we have this community of, um, I, I just can't imagine there's another profession, another field that has such a given community that's so supportive of one another. Um, the relationships and bonds are so strong. I have a little crew that I, you know, talk to every Wednesday. And we've got our little Wednesday crew and we, uh, of, you know, diversity um, professionals and we just share best um, practices. So how it's, it's been partly learning and um, experience and an amazing uh, community um, of, of, of people, especially on the law firm side. That's great. I'm gonna just go into the chat and see what questions we have. One of the ones, I feel like we've answered quite a few of these. Um, one of the ones that I thought might be interesting is what initiative for your firm is most exciting to you personally? Mm, I can speak to that. Uh, I've done a programming series where I really wanna make sure that we are celebrating our cultural uniqueness. Uh, because I do feel that oftentimes people are operating inside of law firms, whether you're an attorney or you're a member of the staff, uh, and people don't really see you. And what I mean by see you is not just simply like, you know, oh, I acknowledge that you're there, uh, but I understand your intersectionality. I understand what some of the issues are that individuals who look like you or act like you, you know, may be facing. Uh, and so we go there. Uh, and so, you know, we don't just scratch the surface and talk about you know, some of the things that are, you know, now, you know, kind of trite, you know, and just talking about, oh, being a person of color in the profession. No, we had an entire program about black hair in the workplace. 
let's go there. Let's break it down. Let's talk to you about what it means for people to try to talk about code switching. It's not just a matter of your vocabulary. It's a matter of what people are actually doing to their bodies uh, and, you know, and how they show up. Uh, and really, what are also some of the psychological um, uh, effects that that has on you? Uh, and so we are really just trying to um, uh, bring some awareness uh, around that and really let our employees feel seen. Uh, and really, when you do that, uh, you talk about taking people from a level of satisfaction with their job to this level of engagement. And you talk about underscoring belonging. Um, that's really what I have found uh, I've been able to glean from all of this is that I have employees, again, across the board, not just the attorneys, uh, who say, oh my gosh, thank you. I really wanted, you know, to educate folks on the fact that it's not proper for you to go around and touch my hair, but I never had the courage to say it. So thank you for starting that conversation for me. And so we're doing that, again, as to all dimensions of diversity and making sure that that cultural uniqueness is celebrated. So looking in the interest of time, try to stay on track. I'm going to allow each of the panelists to kind of give their kind of closing marks. And I'll start with you, Mike Keisha, as the one three months, like I'm sure it's been gone so fast, but then you're like, there's still so much to do. Um, so what kind of parting words do you have for the audience today? Okay, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Rashida. Thank you for the great panel. And, and um, I think that uh, that expression, and I'm, I'm, I might get it wrong, but something about the rising tide lifting all boats, is really applicable for this work. And, and by that, I mean um, where we share collective responsibility, share collective ownership, and don't allow phrases like diversity fatigue um, to creep in and, and take root. We can create cultures and help to transform existing cultures to be truly inclusive. It's not easy work, it's not a light lift, but remain curious, remain empathetic, remain courageous, um, remain okay being uncomfortable um, and, and to hitting some things that's squarely on and, and, and ultimately remain collaborative uh, and leverage your, your, your teammates and all of us out here in this space to help, uh, to help keep your boat afloat. I love that. Selena, what would you like to add? I would say don't go it alone. Right. All of us are stewards in this work and try to move it forward and must rely on others to help move it forward. So I think the collective is going to be far more successful than any of us trying to go it on our own. So just as you as uh, you mentioned, you have your community on Wednesdays. How do we rely on each other to be helpful in this work? And so anyone I'll, I will offer again, feel free to reach out if there's anything I can do personally to help. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Sylvia. Um, the one piece of advice is I was just piggybacking off of um, everything I've um, heard. It's keep one foot um, over the line. Um, push. I, I, I at least have one, sometimes both feet on the line and approaching over the line. You've got to, if you're staying comfortable and everyone loves you all the time and that they think you're a yes and you're not challenging them. You're not doing your job. Right. So keep pushing, know when to pull back because you've got to know the culture, uh, but come back again um, and, and just keep pushing for change. I love that. And that's definitely something that we have to remember. Yusuf? I think I would say um, for anybody who is committed to this in any big or small way, I think you just give yourself a little bit of grace. Um, I think that the work that we do is oftentimes highly personal um, to us and our own experiences too. And it's really difficult to compartmentalize that. I mean, I think all of us who are in these roles full time, we try to compartmentalize to some degree because we sort of have to, to survive. Um, but give yourself a little bit of grace on it. I think what we're trying to do is undo you know, centuries of discrimination. Um, and really we're, it's, it's, it's drop by drop, right? Um, so be kind to yourself as you think about this work and where we want to go with it, because it's it's a long journey. And Lloyd? d &I work is just like any other department in an organization, uh, and it should be given the same level of respect and gravitas that you give to any of the other business lines. Uh, and so when I hear things like diversity fatigue, I don't subscribe to that. 
you know, I subscribe to, you know, the microaggression fatigue and the bias fatigue. Those are the fatigues I have, mm -hmm. but there's no way in any business that you can say, you know what, I've got, I'm growing tired of all of our fiscal policy and our fiscal management and all these freaking HR rules. I'm just, oh, I have HR fatigue. No, you don't get a chance to have a fatigue for any of your business lines. Uh, this is what keeps the business afloat. There's no such thing as diversity fatigue. We're not going to take our foot off the gas. We're not going to slow down. You're going to have to catch up. Uh, because we're creating an inclusive culture here and it, it involves you keeping one foot over the line. It involves you, you know, having that grace, everything that my co-panelists have already said. So uh, let's just make sure that everyone else who steps into any of our organizations knows that this is a ship that is going to keep moving ahead. I love that in closing. I mean, it definitely is not a sprint. It's a marathon. We didn't get here overnight. Um, I am very much honored to have each of you on this panel and, and to share and talk about things that we are all very passionate about. Um, the self-care is always real because I think that was the advice that Sylvia gave to me because you give so much yourself because you want people to be successful and, uh, and continue to be their champions. Um, again, I, all of us are, are available on LinkedIn, so you can connect with us. Love to continue the conversation. We'll see what happens in year two. Uh, looking forward to that. We can have a, a reunion and you know, doing that. So to everyone who attended today, we had a wonderful attendance. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to share some time with us. Um, we have recorded, we'll probably need to just do a couple of edits and making sure of all of our organizations have signed off on this particular panel and making sure. So big thanks to Millbank, KPMG, Winston and Strong, Davis Wright Tremaine, and Buchanan Ingersoll. I am very grateful to all of your organizations and support for making today a success. So with that, I will say farewell and hope you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye.